Kids, you're dismissed the primary worship. Wow, Russ. We have some visitors here today, quite a few. How, tell them how young you are, Russ. Can you hear me? Hey, Russ, you can play well. You can't hear too well. Tell them how young you are. I can't hear either. Am I? 91 years young. Amazing, isn't it? 91 years young. And when you were playing, I was ready to get up and start dancing. I mean, man, I love that. This is my father's world. That's so true. Good morning, Christian Church of Litchfield. Hey, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting with us today, we want to welcome you to our services, and we just pray it'll be a blessing to you in your walk with God. I so appreciated the presentation this morning during what would normally be our Sunday school hour. Incredible uh, principles brought out that I thought, man, they're stealing my thunder. That's, that's what I'm going to be saying today in this message, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, excellent presentation. Thanks for being with us today, and thanks for the work you're doing for Christ. We just began last week a new series this summer on the life of David, and we call it Defining Moments. Defining Moments. You know, that moment when you're at a crossroad and the decision made will shape your life forever. Last week, we began by looking at picking a winner. And we saw the problem is, God says, we look on outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. And how that David was basically rejected by everybody but God. And he had to overcome that rejection uh, to become the next king of Israel. And so today, we begin, and we're going to look at the theme that everybody needs a Goliath. Everybody needs a giant in their life that's bigger than themselves. That when they look at him, they'll say, there's just no way. No way possible. But two words will change the outcome, and those two words are, but God. When God is factored in, everything changes. We're going to pick up our scripture this morning. It's on the PowerPoint. Here we go today. Then Goliath. We've heard that name many Many times, even people that never go to church, have no relationship with God, know the David Goliath story. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. Nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of male weight 125 pounds. That's how much his armor weight. I can't lift that much. That's what he wore to battle. Incredible. Verses 6 and 7. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a, a shield. Man, this guy, he was literally a, a, a giant. I did some research this week as in the Guinness Book of Records, and I wanted to search the biggest man recorded that, that's ever lived. And the record still stands. I, I, in fact, I, I'll bet over half of you know the name and where he's from. How many of you know the answer to that? Look at the hands go up. Yeah, let's hear it. Robert Wadlow. Robert Wadlow. Yeah. Anybody remember how tall he was? 8'11". He almost <laughs> hit 9 feet. But he's still smaller than, than Goliath, who was almost 10, by the way most uh, uh, translations read. Incredible. Robert Wadlow, the Alton Giant. Anybody remember his shoe size? 
37. Can you imagine going to I like a size 37 shoe. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, man. His ring size. I think I have fat hands, big hands for my, you know, my ring finger is about 14 and a half. And uh, I how come I my wedding ring a long time ago. And uh, it doesn't, nothing fits anymore. 14 and a half. Do you know what his ring size was? 25. 25. Wow. Incredible. Big pig man. Understatement of, of the day. So this Goliath, this giant oh, tipping almost 10 feet on the measuring stick. His, his gear, his armor, weighing probably 150 pounds, something, weigh its translation be closer to 200 pounds, just the armor, comes down every day in 1 Samuel chapter 17, and he begins to curse Israel, and he curses the God of Israel. And he says, guys, we're going to make this real simple. It's going to be winner takes all. And he says, come down here. Send your best man. If he beats me, we're your slaves forever. But if I beat him, you, the Israelites, will be our slaves forever. We don't need everybody getting killed, so let's just do a one-on-one. -on -one. Nobody. Nobody would answer the call. Do you realize who should have responded to that challenge if there was one man who, who was least closest to respond to the challenge? Who should it have been? Yeah, King Saul, because we saw last week, he stood head and shoulders above all the other men of Israel in the army. <laughs> We're going to see today, David's the one who goes out and fights him, and he's not even in the army. He's been taking care of some sheep. And uh, so I, 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 one of the funniest scenes is when he comes into Saul and he says, we're going to see it in a moment later in the message. He says, you know, here, if you're going to fight Goliath, take my armor, try it. Saul knew he wasn't going to be putting it on and going out and fighting Goliath. Here, you can have it, you know. And David says, man, this doesn't work for me. But uh, next verse we see here is, is the rejection that he has to overcome. So David's asking all these questions. He's been sent to bring food to his brothers from his father, Jesse. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the men about Goliath and these, this challenge, he was angry. This is like a big brother, isn't it? What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? You know, isn't that just, just really put down big time? I know your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. So he comes to David and he says, why are you asking all these questions? You, you know, uh, who do you think you are? And that's one of the things you're going to have to overcome with the giants in your life. There's going to be those voices that say, you don't have a chance. Would you, who do you think you are? Just go back. Retreat. Go back home to your menial task. You see, David was told to take some bread and some meat and some food to his brothers who were serving in the army. He was a shepherd boy. He didn't know that day there would come a crossroad in his life that would be a defining moment. And he would be known forever because of his response to this giant that stood directly in front of him all. Goliath. So if we're going to take down the giants in our life, here's what we learned from David in this passage, and here we go. First point, we're going to go through these pretty quick because we've got a lot of them. You've got to have the right motive. You've got to have the right motive. What is it that motivates you to respond? Look, look at David's motive here. We read, David replied to the Philistine when he was getting ready to go fight. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. By the way, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Understand clearly what David's motive was for going into battle. 
He wasn't off on an ego trip. In fact, I can prove that to you. Who wrote most of the Psalms? David. Not all of them, but most of them. How many are there? 150, right? Let me ask you, how many times does he ever talk after this incident about the day he beat the giant Goliath? Zero. Read them all. Boy, if that had been me, you know. Kids, this reminds me of that time <laughs> when the odds makers, I just blew them away there in Vegas, and I went out and took this on this guy. You wouldn't believe how tall he was. He was 10 feet tall. At that time, I was 4'10". And, you know, <laughs> you just don't, you don't read it, do you? Show me one example in the Bible where David brags about his victory over Goliath. He never refers to it because it wasn't his victory and he was motivated not off on an ego trip. He was motivated because he says, this guy is cursing and defying the name of God and I'm not going to put up with it. If it cost me my life, so be it. But I'm going to take a stand today for the name of God. Folks, if you're going to take on the giants in your life, you've got to take a stand for the honor of God. And I, you have ample opportunity. I have ample opportunity every day. Look at the world around us. We have ample opportunity. And Satan says, come on. You want to take a stand? You want to speak up? And some of the giants you and I are going to face are going to make this literal nine feet, ten foot giant of Goliath seem pretty small by comparison. I think I would like to have been in David's shoes rather than face what I'm facing. You've got to say, what motivates me? That is so, so important that you say, I'm not off on an ego trip here. I'm here to, because to honor God and his name. That's why it turned out the way it did. Second lesson, and this is so important. Place your confidence in God, not self. Confidence is important, isn't it? I, I mean, if you say, well, I don't think I can make that shot. If a basketball player says, oh, man, you, you know, I, I, I don't think I can make that shot. He's, you know, he's not going to make it. You've got to have confidence. Give me the ball. Give me the ball. I can make the shot. Give me the bat. Put me in as a pinch hitter. I can hit him. I can hit that pitcher. I can get the hit we need. You know, you want somebody confident. You want somebody to say, oh, don't put me up there. I, I can't hit the broad side of a barn. It's over. You're not going to hit the broad side of a barn. But what the world does is say, we say, so be confident. You can do whatever you think you can do. Believe in yourself. Remember that song, I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I love that song. I remember hearing it on the radio one day. And I thought, I bet I can slam dunk the basketball in our, in our barn. It's 10 feet, just like standard height. I slammed into the wall. I mean to tell you, I saw stars. I got a concussion out of that. It was ugly. And uh, it don't matter what you believe. If you are not focused on, on God, the confidence has to be in God's power, not just in, I can do it. Look who I am. Look what David says here. Today, the Lord, today, when you go home this week, 1 Samuel 17, circle every time he refers to the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, and not himself, and, and not even Goliath. He doesn't look to Goliath, he's looking to God. The Lord will conquer you, and I'll kill you and cut off your head, and then I'll give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. His confidence was in God. Now, understand, this had been developed when nobody was looking. Remember what we talked about last week? As a shepherd taking care of the sheep, he had taken on some giants, hadn't he? 
Because when he goes to fight King Saul, he says, <laughs> Saul says, you're just a kid. He says, you know, who are you, you know, to, to go out and, and fight? And he says, you know, King Saul, I, I've killed lions and bears protecting the sheep. Let me tell you, somebody tells me he can whip a lion or a bear, I'm willing to pay me the ring with Goliath. How about you? Yeah. He did that just to protect the sheep. The difference now is he's want to honor God's name. A lot more is at stake here. And so his confidence was built as he looks back in his life at the track record of God. Let me tell you, next time you face a giant, some of you are today facing a giant in your life, and you say, I just don't know. How old are you? Don't answer out loud. I know you wouldn't anyway, but how old are you? What, look back and say, oh, and say, how many other giants have I faced in my life? I can name you a lot in mine. And they'd be different than yours. And that's okay. Some might be the same, some might not, but it doesn't matter. But look at the giants you faced in your life. How'd you get from that point to today? By the power and the grace and the goodness of God. And that's how. God, his track record is impeccable. It is incredible. You can trust God. Let's quickly move on. Look at the third lesson we learned about going up against the... Stay with your strengths. Okay, now here's what we read, and this is the funny part. Okay, then Saul gave David his own armor, because like I said, he knew he wasn't going to be using it. A bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword on, over it, and took a, a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. Can't you see, little David, in this, because Saul's a big, big guy, and him walking around, and, and it's over his eyes, and, and he can hardly move in it, you know, it's so heavy. This ain't going to work, he says. Let's see what he says. I can't go on these. He protested Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream. That must have been Shoal Creek. And put them into his shepherd's bag. And then armed with only his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Stay with your strengths, man. Stay with your strengths. Russ has been playing the harmonica, I don't know, how many years he's been playing, probably forever, uh, 91, I don't know. He's been playing them many years. You know what I would tell Russ? Keep on playing the harmonica. You do it well. That's your sweet spot. Um, and he does. He goes to nursing homes. And the other week he was telling me, I said, how, did you have a good week? Refer to the past week. He says, oh, he says, kind of a little weather. I was only able to go to three, four nursing homes this week and play. I go, oh, yeah, a really bad week for a 91-year-old man, you know. <laughs> wow. Getting old there, Russ. But, uh, you know, isn't it incredible? Stay with your strength. Do what God has gifted you to do and keep on doing it. Like I said, it'd be, it'd be ludicrous for me to say, you know, God, you know, maybe you can use me in the music department. My God goes, no! I, he'd throw me out before I ever got in the door, you know, and I don't blame him, you know. Somebody should, you know. So just don't try to say, I'm going to do this or that. Just stay with your strengths. Um, that's just so important. Number four, we've got to quickly move here. Verbally, praise God. Man, there's just, just real power in that. Look what David does here. Understand, Goliath has been trash talking. You talk about trash talking, Goliath holds the record for that. And Here's what we read. It says, and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle. He'll give you to us. He says, I'm going to praise God before this fight ever begins for the victory that, that's been won. You say, 
How can you praise God for something that hasn't happened yet? You can. You can. Folks, the victory for us was won at Calvary. It was won at the open tomb that first Easter morning, that resurrection morning on Sunday morning. When they went there and the stone was rolled away, the victory was won. You can't lose. That's why in the book of Revelation it shows the, the fight of the ages between the forces of hell and the demons and Satan against God before it ever begins. If you notice in Revelation, it declares praise to God for the victory that's been won. So let's celebrate. It hasn't even happened yet. doesn't matter. It's over when God is factor into it. Bring God into the equation. I can tell you how the outcome is going to be. And so to those who would put down the name of God, there's just power in, in, in praise, praising God. So much power in, in praising God. And that's what I really want you to do. It, it can change any situation. I remember when uh, my colon had, had ruptured and I was in and out of the hospital a couple times and um, I, they finally operated. And I remember after the operation, it had been about three days, I guess, and it seemed like every day I was getting worse and worse and worse. And, I, and you know, I'd never been sick a day before in my life, before my colon had ruptured. And, and, and so I, I wasn't handling it well, and I just thought, you know, I don't think I'm going to get out of this thing alive. I mean, that's not great thoughts to have, but I, I really felt that bad. And I remember one night, God is my witness, Sammy was there staying with me because I was so bad. She was sitting in a chair uh, trying to sleep, and I couldn't sleep, and I began to sing. I did. I went through every song I could think of. And let me tell you, I grew up in the church, as you know, since I was a baby. I know a lot of songs. I still know every word to a lot of the hymns. I mean, I did it all. Old drug and cross, how great thou art, blessed assurance. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, uh, trust and obey uh, in the garden. Uh, I even did some modern ones for me. It's pretty modern as the deer. <laughs> That's about as modern as it gets. You know, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, into contemporary. But, man, I mean, I was singing them all, all night long. And uh, I thought, you know, I tried to sing softly, but, but I did, I was just, I'm just going to praise God, you know. I'm either going to get better or else they're going to take me out of here into a, in a casket. One way or the other, I'm either going to go home to the farm that I love or else I'm not staying here anymore and this is going the wrong direction. So I just, I did, I sang all night long. Nurses would come in and say, shut up, got to take a temperature, you know. Uh, you know, and uh, man, I did, I, I did it. And that was really a turning point. Now, it's not magic. Uh, it could have just gotten worse and worse. But for me, um, it was a turning point. I never looked back. Uh, just got stronger greatly every day after that. Um, Fervently praise God. I, I tell you, it sure helped me through the nine. Not even knowing how the outcome was going to be. And the next time when you're just overcoming, just, just start singing with nobody's around. If you sing like me, that's the best time to sing. Uh, and, 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 and just start singing, praising God. You're going to find it will change you. It may not change the outcome of that, but it will change you. Let's quickly move on, number five. Move toward the giant. Don't run. Look what David does. It says here, as Goliath moved closer to attack. This guy's coming after David. Do you think you'd have second thoughts? This wasn't such a good idea anyway. Let's see how fast I can run. David quickly ran out to meet him. Greetings and salutations, Goliath. Here I am. Wow. Let's rumble. That's incredible courage and faith. Not to run and hide, but to face your giant. Some of you today may have a giant before you. If not, you will at some point. There'll be a Goliath. And the tendency, of course, is I think I just need to play it safe, and I think I, I, I just need to retreat, and I think I just need to go back to the sheep, and uh, I think I just need to play it safe. 
I was never, never picked to be a giant killer, and so I'm just going to take a pass on it. It's an option. But it'll haunt you for the rest of your life. You think you play it safe and everything's fine. No, not really. Number six, finish the task. Finish the task. Here we read. And this is where sometimes we, we forget. Reaching into a shepherd's bag, taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. By the way, that was the only place they didn't have any armor for. He had the shield bearer, he had all the armor and stuff, except his head, top part of his head. And people say, now nah, this is just pure luck, you know, this, this slingshot and stone bit. Folks, I am told that back then, it was a powerful, powerful weapon. That they could get that velocity and whip that thing up, and when they would release it, I guess based on today's calculus, it could hit speeds of 200 miles per hour. How would you like to get hit in the forehead with a 90 mile per hour fastball from one of the major league pitchers? How would you like a 200 mile per hour rock in your forehead? That's probably was the speed. Taking out stone, he hurled over the slingshot, hit the flitch in the forehead, the stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Now we think it's over. It's not over until it's over. Let's read on. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. But then David ran over, pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. That's not really done him in. The, the rock knocked him unconscious or whatever, but he didn't just say, oh, that's good enough. He finished the, finished the job. And there's a real tendency, you know, let, let, let's say that you're, you're deep in debt, and you say, man, we're going to do this debt thing. We're going to do the Dave Ramsey program. We're going to bust it. And, and you begin taking bill down after bills. They, they just disappear, and you're paying them off. And you make it. There's a tendency after a while to coast. Hey, this is good enough. We've arrived. Finish it. It'll come back to haunt you if you don't. Don't, <laughs> I don't know how it is. Once in a while, I, I, I don't like these kind of movies, but I don't realize it's a kind of movie until the movie's over. You know what I mean? But it's one of those movies where, where, where somebody's being stalked by the bad guy, and, and, and finally they take him out, or so it seems, and they just keep coming back. You know what I mean? Don't you hate those movies when you think he's done, finished, and he comes back? You know, and you say, finish him off. Don't just give him one bullet. Put them all in him, you know. And uh, finish the task. If the guy is coming after you to kill you, your children, finish the task. Don't just say, well, I'll slap his hand. You know, David says, God calls us to finish, finish the job. I wonder how many jobs and ministries are just left half finished in the kingdom because we just got discouraged. You said, well, we did enough. It's not enough until the job's done. And we do it to the glory, glory of God. You know, most of you, I debated whether or not to, to share this with you. But this week, God really worked me over with this message before I could preach it to you. I thought it was going to be a pretty uneventful week. You know, I thought quiet is good. You know, routines, schedule, I like. And it started off that way until about Wednesday, about 4 or 4.30. I received a call from Terry Plummer. And I've got his name, number on my phone, and I knew it was him. And I knew when it was ringing what the call was going to be. And I, I took the call, and he said, I have Karen here, Karen Bandy, I see, yeah. And he said, they want to know, and I'm thinking, yeah, will you do Mike Bandy's funeral on, on Saturday at 3 o'clock? I said, sure. Karen used to be my secretary, sweetest gal uh, ever. 
Karen, are you here today? I don't even know if she's here today or, or not. She was going to try and make it. But sweet gal. And uh, uh, I said, sure, do anything for Karen. And um, I said, yeah, I, I, I'll do that service. And it was going to be tough, but, uh, y- you know. But while I'm talking to Terry on the phone, my phone's ringing, and, and I see I have another call coming in. I thought, I don't know that number. And uh, so after I got off the phone with Terry, I immediately uh, hit redial uh, of, of that number. And the moment the guy answered and said two words, I knew where this one was going. He said, Steve, he says, this is Todd Dean. And we said those two words, Todd Dean. I knew immediately where we were headed. And I I remember my first response because I had known what had happened. And he said, I have Dave and Sally with me. I go, yeah. And he said, they really would like for you to do the funeral for their son who took his life this week at age 40. And I go, boy, I said, I I wish I could. But I already have a funeral Saturday. And he says, well, that's okay. It's understandable. Because I thought, man, what do you say? You know, I, 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 wow. You know, I just, you know, I I just can't do that. And uh, I said, uh, I thought maybe they had, somebody else in mind. He says, well, they really wanted you. I said, they did. He goes, yeah. I said, what time's the service? He said, 10 o'clock in the morning. I thought, 10, 3. I'm not going to speak five hours of that first one, you know. So uh, I'd still be able to do them both. And I said, yeah, I can do it. I hung up and I thought, what did I just agree to? I mean, honest, you know. My first response was Steve Ravisky's response. This, this is tough. I don't like tough assignments. This is big. This is a couple I've known most of my life. I used to come to church here. I saw their two little boys grow up. And the other brother, Kurt, took his life three and a half years ago during a divorce. And now they lose their second and only other child in the same manner. What do you say when words just seemingly have nothing to them? I immediately called Dave and Sally and I said, uh, could I come over and just sit down and talk with you? I just want to talk. They said, oh, wish you would. So I went over there, spent a couple hours or more, perhaps Thursday morning. People waiting outside to come in and visit with them there at the house. But, but we just talked alone, cried together. Uh, they're just a beautiful, wonderful couple. And uh, I can't even begin to go where they're at and say, hey, I understand what you're going through. I don't understand. I don't understand nothing, you know. And I thought, oh, we got here is a bunch of questions. And, and it seems like there's just no answers. And I knew the next couple days I wouldn't get much sleep, and I didn't. But I believe that, you know, I've dedicated my life to a God who is the answer and who can bring healing, who can bring comfort in any and every situation. And I told God, I said, so help me. If I feel like I am on my own, I am going to drive as far. You think Jonah ran away. You ain't seen nothing yet. I got to know I'm not even in the picture. But you said you can take a jar of clay, which is very fragile and can break very easily. In fact, I said, God, this, this pot's cracked. Yeah, I'm a cracked pot. You're taking a cracked pot here to bring healing and comfort to a family that I... It doesn't seem can have any healing or comfort. And I had some key people pray for me. And um, I knew it would be packed and it was standing room only. They were all the way to the other end of the funeral home in every room possible. And, and, you know, I thought, wow, this family. 
God needs to know three young children left behind. That One of them was at Montgomery Christian Service Camp this past week. They had to go and tell. He decided to go back to camp. And when I went up with a family at visitation, on Friday evening at 4.30 before all the public came in. I'm there with a the family. I go over to the three children and just kneel down in front of them and talk to them. And, and Josh says, Preacher, can you help me? I says, I, I want to try. What can I do for you? He says, at camp, we're learning the Ten Commandments. And I can't remember what the Second Commandment is. Would you help me, please? I couldn't even think of one Ten Commandment at that point. I'm sobbing and my mind's just a swirling. And I go, Ten Commandments. <clears throat> I said, well, Josh, tell me how many you know. Because I thought by process of elimination, I can kind of figure out, you know. And I did. Uh, I lucked out on that one because he was rattling them off. And I thought, whoo, you know. And I said, well, I think it might be this one. Oh, yes, that's the one he said. I thought, man, I can't even think of the first one, let alone the second one, you know. And uh, I just had drawn a blank on everything that night. And uh, in the message, I, I talked about these kids. And I said, you know, you've been at camp learning about Jesus. You hang on to him because your heavenly father is reaching out to you right now. And you need a dad more than anything in this world. And he wants to be your father. You know, I'm going to ask you to pray for Dave and Sally and and those three children. Talk about a giant in your life. I, I look at my life and I think, I don't think I've ever faced any giants now. I thought I had several named and, it, you know, I shake my head. Uh, I, I think God really did uh, work and, and speak through the power of his word. And, and there were some other things happening I'm not even going to share with you uh, that I really didn't expect. And... Uh, I told Dave and Sally, I says, when everything's said and gone and all the people are gone and things try to get back to normal, I'm going to come over and we're going to keep on talking and praying. They said, please do, you know. So I pray for an opportunity. Say, God, give me an opportunity to people who are hurting so I can make a difference. I said, oh, not quite that big. Let's, 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 let's tone it down some, you know. I don't know why they wanted me. I mean, there were other, I didn't do their other son's funeral, but, but I'm glad they did. Not for my sake, because that's the last place I want to be. But I really believe we have a God who specializes in taking down the giants. You know, I want to I tell you right now, would we have ever known, would the world have ever known who David was had there not been a Goliath. The world would have never heard of David. We might have read something about him in the Bible, but had there not been a Goliath in his life, the world would have never known who David was. He thought he was taking lunch out to his brothers in the army, and he was a shepherd. He didn't realize it was a crossroad, a defining moment. It would change his life forever because he says, with God, all things are possible. The victory is his. I want to be a part of it. God, use me to your glory and honor. Will you do that? We're going to stand and sing our invitation hymn as our praise team comes. And whatever your decision is, it's a defining moment today. Will you come?